Welcome to Speaking Opera. My name is Howard Hart. I have a special guest with me today, who is my first guest in 2023. And he is a special guest. We've known each other for a long time. I used to go to his house. He would cook dinner and play records, and we would laugh and talk and have a wonderful time. And we have reconnected after 55 years. My special guest today, who has done actually since we met the last time, has been a conductor, a pianist, a vocal coach, and a composer. All of those things he was working on at the New England Conservatory of Music. We had many mutual friends. He's a delight. He's still a delight. And I want to welcome Benton Hess to Speaking Opera. Welcome, Benton. Thank you, Howard. It's wonderful to be here. Has it really been 55 years? Sort of. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> Can we edit that out? No. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, no. It's wonderful seeing you. It's been so many years. I feel that even though we have not seen each other in many years, and thanks to social media, we're reconnected, uh, the time has not passed for me with you. It feels just like the 55 years ago. There's the same warmth and uh, and wonderful sense of humor. Well, how nice for you to say so. Uh, <laughs> There's been a lot of blood under the bridge in those 55 years, but but I feel the same actually about you too. I mean, I, I would have recognized you on the street, first of all. I you know, I would have said, Howard Hart, what are you doing here? And uh, yes, there, there are very few people in your life actually that you can just pick up where you left off. And uh, you know, there we are. Thank you. We have many mutual friends. Um, I, I'm fairly active on social media, and I believe you are too. I do want to mention something that touched me very deeply, um, and then we'll go into uh, a question I actually have for you, is how kind you are with all of the students and the people you work with in, have worked with in through the years you've worked with. You have worked with in these years um, with birthdays and photographs of collaborations, groupings together, uh, that kind of thing. and you are very good about that and about posting it and about the relationships, which are very, really special. Well, it's, it's, it's nice that you think that I'm being nice, but actually I'm, I'm, I'm really doing it for myself to tell you the truth, because all of my memories of those people are when I was young, um, for the most part, or, you know, certainly at a younger part of my life and, and uh, keeping in touch with them now, with a lot of them I haven't been in touch with since, like you, for instance. And so rejoining with you sort of brings me back to my to my youth, you know. I'm I'm trying for that. That works for me too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, no, I enjoy doing it. I I try to keep in touch with people if I can. Well, you do a wonderful job. Some of the names I recognize and some I don't. Before I mention, um, you sent me an email or in correspondence uh, before we did the, this podcast, and I want to read it and have you respond to it. Uh, and I'd like to, after that, go and ask you a question about some of the singers you've worked with. I didn't put that on the list originally, but I think it's very interesting. I notice now and then in your correspondence on uh, social media that you've worked with some of my favorite singers and I, so it's all about me I guess right when I read them so but here we go with uh, this you sent me last week this uh, message and um, it really made me think a lot about um, well I think that the people who are listening who love opera will completely relate to it so I don't have to over explain and you write to me I do like talking about how I have come to the realization that careers are largely built on being in the right place at the right time. And the act of being at the right place at the right time is not brought, up, brought about by luck, but rather by skill. I know many, many wonderful singers who should be having great careers who seem not to be able to get anyone to hire them. I know an equal amount of singers with only a modicum of talent who are hired in the great opera houses of the world. Can you expand on that? I find it very... Well, the idea of, of it being a skill to be in the right place at the time, actually, I've, I've come to that thought 
that I was going to say realization, but not everybody might agree with me, but I, I, I think I'm right. Certainly in my own career, it has been the case that I just managed to be in the right place at the right time. And then in uh, looking at that, uh, I have tried to see if, if I, if I personally had anything to do with being in the right place at the right time. And I think that I did have something to do with, with that. Um, it, 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 one of the ways that we, that we say this in ordinary jargon is you're judged by the friends you keep. Uh, and it's not that I'm a social climber or, or any of that, at least I hope people don't think that I'm a social climber, but I enjoy with, of, I enjoy being with successful people in my profession. I've always enjoyed being with successful people in my pr profession, not because I was trying to necessarily climb the ladder, but it's because I find them interesting. I find their stories interesting. And when you do that, when you seek their their companionship, their friendship, their you know whatever their their company, why then you learn things about your profession that you didn't know before, therefore making it easier for you to climb the ladder. So I mean, it seems it, I don't know. It seems pretty simple. It's it's a simplistic thing to say, but uh, but I think it's it's true, and I find that young singers today frequently don't do that. As a matter of fact, young singers today don't even bother to listen to the old singers of the past that we have on recordings. It's a tragedy. Oh my goodness. What a richness we have. Lucky us. We're really, you know, the first, maybe this, the second generation to be able to enjoy that. And, uh, and what we can learn, not, not that style has changed over the years. Um, people like a certain kind of singing today that they didn't necessarily like a generation or two generations ago. But you can go, you can go past that. You can listen past that. And you say, oh yes, she's singing. You can criticize her because she's singing a lot of Portamento and Mozart or whatever she's doing that we don't do these, these days. Okay, get over it, get over yourself <laughs> and listen to what else she's doing. Um, because there's an awful lot of what she has learned from her teachers. Her teacher might have been around, you know, in that generation right after Mozart was living. Mm -hmm. So I think it's it's just a shame. Even and every year it gets a little bit worse. I mean, uh, I I had a soprano recently, uh, and a good a good soprano too, and a bright soprano who didn't know who Renata Tibaldi was. Ah. What? <laughs> what? Yeah. You know, it's it's a shame, really. Oh, anyway, so 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 back to being in the right place at the right time. Part of that, uh, being in the right place at the right time, is well, I guess maybe I've said the story already, um, but a lot of it can come just from listening and listening to choosing the people that you want to listen to, from whom you can learn a lot. Is that enough? <laughs> I'm fascinated. I'm listening. I did want to mention something. I I started a little opera club. I shouldn't say little. I don't like that. I started an opera club here in Wakefield, and I thought, you know, it would be me and two other people in the basement with some CDs, and it's turned into something very different. Um, we have actually, even in the bad weather, we have big groups of people, and people love it. And they say to me. I don't know anything about opera. And then I think, but that's why you're here to mm -hmm. learn about it. And it's very much connected to what you said about listening to recordings of, of singers. This month I'm doing Singers Forgotten Remembered nice. because I'm running into, I'm, I'm speaking often to singers who are in the beginning part of their career who don't know who Verdi Nielsen is, who don't know, oh. they don't know any of the singers, Joan Sutherland, Franco Corelli, I spoke to a tenor the other day who didn't listen to Franco Corelli. He didn't know who he was. And I thought, even on YouTube, 
one would think. I know, I know it's not as though you, you don't have to buy CDs anymore. Just go to YouTube. I, 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 I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was, I was just thinking actually that, that my own career has been one of being at the right place at the, at the, at the right time. As, as I said, uh, I guess when I, when I wrote to you, but, and, and you were there actually, because when I knew you, I was already teaching at Boston University. Mm -hmm. Listen to how that happened. That was, that was a, the fluke beyond all flukes. I had been at, a student at New England Conservatory. I graduated in 1969. In about 1960, the spring of 1968, John Moriarty heard me play for the very first time. And he decided, and he, and he, without hearing me play in person, he, we didn't have any interconnection whatsoever, but he called me up on a Friday afternoon in early summer in 1968 and asked if I was free for the summer. And I was selling records in Cray's disc shop in Prudential Center, thinking I was going to be there for the entire summer selling records. Mm -hmm. And John Moriarty said, we've just lost one of our rehearsal pianists at Lake George Opera Festival. Can you come and play? And, and, play? and I said, let me think about it. Yes. And so he picked me up on Sunday. I, I quit my job at Cray's Disc Shop. Uh, it was only the second week that I had worked there, and I quit my job there. And he picked me up on Sunday afternoon and drove me to the Lake George Opera Festival, where I sight read the entire, I sight read the entire season because I didn't have any time to practice. And of course, they were already in rehearsals. I was just going to going to staging rehearsals and and sight reading, trying to sight read as best I could. So while I was at the Lake George Opera Festival, I was introduced to this stage director named Adelaide Bishop. Adelaide Bishop was a great lady, a really wonderful, wonderful person, a wonderful mentor of mine, a wonderful friend of mine. Um, she's been dead just a couple of years now, and I miss her terribly. But anyway, she was there at the Lake George Opera Festival that summer. And uh, that the fall after that summer in 1969, she was going to take over running the opera program at Boston University. She was moving to, she wasn't moving, she was going to uh, 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 just come every week, you know, to uh, Boston from Washington, D.C., where she lived with her husband, who was a lawyer. So anyway, I got to know her. We hit it off. We liked each other very, 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 very much. And I knew that she, and I was so glad that she was going to be coming to Boston because I would see her every now and again uh, in, in Boston when she came up to teach. Um, when I finished at Lake George Opera Festival that summer, I went back to Boston and I was in the conservatory one day practicing in the afternoon. And when I finished practicing, I went home to my little apartment on the fourth floor walk up on St. Stephen Street. And there was in my mailbox, there was a message. There was a little note written to me from Adelaide Bishop on the back of one of her checks. It's the only piece of paper that she had. So she just, you know, scratched over the thing of the check and on the back, she wrote a message to me, Benton, please call me at this number immediately. There were, no, there were no cell phones in those days. So I walked up the four flights of stairs and on my landline in my apartment, I called the number and it was Adelaide. And she says, Benton, can you come to Boston University right away? Right away. This was by now, it was like 4.30 in the afternoon. And I said, yes, I don't drive. You know, I don't have a car, but I'll take the subway over. And she told me it was 855 Commonwealth Avenue. That was the School of Fine and Applied Arts. <clears throat> I don't know what it's called these days, but. And, uh, and so I went to Boston University and she says, meet me in the Dean's office on the second floor. Dr. Wilbur Fulbright was his name. And I went to the Dean's office and Adelaide was there and I hugged her and she introduced me to Dr. Fulbright. And we all sat down. I had no idea what any of this was about. And Dr. Fulbright says, Benton, um, uh, we're kind of in a state of shock because Dr. Ludwig Bergmann, who was a conductor, old German conductor who had been in Boston for a number of years and had run, had been the musical director of the opera program at Boston University for years and years, that morning had dropped dead of a heart attack. And they were 
frantically trying to find somebody who could be the musical director. I had just finished my bachelor's degree at New England Conservatory. And Dr. Fulbright said, Benton, I, I know you're young. He said, but Adelaide thinks the world of you, thinks you're just wonderful. Would you like to be the musical director of Boston University Opera Theater? And I said, again, I said, let me think about it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I took over, I, there, there I was. And I didn't know all that much repertoire. I knew the programs that we had done at Lake George Opera Festival in 1968. I knew the operas that we had done at the Lake George Opera Festival in 1969, and that was it. I knew quite a number of arias because I was a, I had played a lot in the voice teacher studios at New England Conservatory when I was still a student there. <clears throat> And there we were. So there, that that got me started of being in the right place at the right time, right? Um, so in the summer of 1970 and 71, John Moriarty came back into the picture, and he was never out of the picture, but he came back in the picture as far as getting me jobs. First of all, he was going to stage direct at Tosca in Oklahoma City, and he got me hired to go to Oklahoma City and play all of the rehearsals for that, for that Tosca. Then he was going to Santa Fe that summer to conduct the Rake's Progress. And could I come to Santa Fe and, you know, and be in one of the apprentice uh, assistant conductors? Let me think about it. Yes. <laughs> so I spent the summers of 70 and 71 in Santa Fe because of John Moriarty again, you know, being in the right place at the right time. And then it just, it just, set off things. So, so Boris Goldowski needed a conductor for his 1972, the fall of 1972 tour, national tour of Rigoletto. He needed a conductor and Ed recommended me. And, um, and Boris hired me sight unseen to conduct this tour. And then I went on, I several years I was not only his conductor but also his tour manager which is a terrible job by the way never never say yes to being a conductor and a tour manager but I did and uh, again being in the right place at the right time but I I think along the way I discovered how to do this how to I discovered how to be in the right place at the right time I think it's an important tool to have it was good and you know the music. I know the music. Yes. I feel very confident saying that. Yes. Uh, I know, you know, there's nobody who can know all of the standard repertoire. It's impossible. There's just too much of it. And uh, to this day, there are pieces that I've never had the opportunity to do that I would just love to. I would have loved to have had the chance to conduct or, or, or even just, just prepare. There's, there's quite a lot of it, as a matter of fact. But um, one, of the, one of the skills that I had that stood me in, in the best stead was being able to sight read. I, I learned I learned that as soon as I arrived at the conservatory, actually, because I went to the conservatory in the fall of 1965, and uh, I was by far the best pianist in Connellsville, Pennsylvania. <laughs> so I thought that I was going to go to conservatory, and then I was going to take over for Archer Rubenstein, because Archer Rubenstein was almost 90 years old, and he needed a replacement, and here I was. There's a solution. There's a solution, right? <laughs> so I went to New England Conservatory um, as a piano major. And as it turns out, the very best pianist from Apex, North Carolina was there. And the very best pianist from Monroe, Louisiana was there. And the very best pianist from, I don't know, someplace in Idaho was there. The very best pianist from someplace in Nevada was there. And they all thought that they were going to be Rubenstein's replacement. They all thought that. And there was one thing that they could do that I didn't want to do, and one thing that I could do that they did that they couldn't do. The thing that they liked to do that I didn't want to do was chain myself to my Steinway for 10 or 12 hours a day alone in a room. I didn't want to do that. I knew that already. 
And the thing that I could do that almost none of them could do was sight read. And so I became a hot commodity very quickly in the voice teacher studios in the Wind Conservatory because if you're a pianist and you play for a violinist or a cellist, you can work for an entire semester on only one sonata. It's very possible that they will take the entire semester just working on one big Beethoven sonata, for instance. You know? And not much sight reading is required at all. But in a voice teacher studio, in a, in a voice studio, they go through a lot of repertoire very fast. And frequently, they're experimenting with repertoire to see just exactly what works and what doesn't. So they need a pianist in there who can, who can pretty much, you know, do it from sight. And I was able to, I was able to function that way. And that was because my parents were both musicians and musicians and they all they both had a lot of uh, repertoire, lots of um, lots of scores sitting on the piano. There was always Messiah there because my mother had to play Messiah every year for a local group that that did it. And um, my father was a was a clarinetist and a saxophonist. I didn't care much about the saxophone in those days, but the, as a clarinetist, he was playing things like uh, the Mozart Concerto and the um, uh, what is that piece that Debussy wrote that's so beautiful? Afternoon of a Fawn. No, no, no this, this is a, this is a, this is a solo piece, a oh. solo clarinet piece with piano. With Premier piano. Rhapsody, Premier Rhapsody, it is, and uh, and so I used to I used to grab that from the top of the piano and play. I used to Messiah whenever I had any any time. I just would I just love to play, just love to sight read, and uh, that's what made me good at it. So you brought back a lot of memories. I was thinking uh, of someone that I actually, I never went to the Conservatory of Music, New, New England Conservatory of Music, everyone thought I did. I actually dated someone who went there. And ah. That's how I met everybody. <laughs> I ah. met actually John Moriarty was friends uh, with the student. And no, don't ask who it is, but I might tell you some other time. Anyway. Um, I think so, I know who it is actually. Uh, you probably do. I and <laughs> I'll, I'll not tell, don't worry. But you know, I'm going to have you come back again if you will, and so we'll say, put that on pause. I'll, 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 I'll not tell for a price. My history in that area is it's <laughs> probably better to be left alone. Um, when um, I want to talk more about your career, but I wanted to mention someone who's very important in my life, and I think you'll be okay with this. I know, I believe you will. Um, when I was in my twenties, I guess. Um, somebody said to me, you've got to hear this mezzo-soprano. She's incredible. And I said, okay, let's go. So, you know, I'd gone to like, and we'll talk about Elena Stieber another time because that's a whole program, right? Oh, you bet it is. it is. And you and I will do that <laughs> together, I promise. And I have an interview that I did with her. It was my very first interview ever was with her. And she was wonderful. And we, I have lots of stories. So we'll do a storytelling thing with Elena Stieber. I think we could probably fit that in. Um, so I went to hear the Smetzel Soprano, and I can tell you, it was absolutely some of the most beautiful singing I've ever heard. And it is was this Donna? It is, is. It Donna? Don, Donna Fortunato. She sang the composer's aria, and it was unbelievable. Little did I know that she would end up being one of my closest friends in my whole life. Oh, that's nice. I've been through, I've heard her sing Gilles Bidami and yeah. <laughs> Handel. Um, and in many, many different, I was at her New York uh, City Opera debut in Alcina, and she got rave reviews. She's been a wonderful friend. And I think when we're talking today, if I'm going to be very open, uh, is that friendships in the world of music are incredible. They're like yeah. nothing else. It's hard yeah. to almost explain what it is when you're talking about how you connect with singers. And um, the singers that I've interviewed that I have on my podcast now, were all a delight. Every single one of them was special in a different way, and none of them were the same. They were all very different. Yes. Uh, there is one thing that they all have in common, and that is they all love to be adored. Well, I am a very good at that, you know. Yes, yes, <laughs> I know you are. And and I think that they they sense that. They can smell it in the water, you know. 
uh, adoration, and uh, and they like that very can much. I can I just close? I have a feeling we're going to do more than one of these. Uh, when Tim Page and I interviewed Elizabeth Schwarzkopf together, he said she liked her. She liked you more than she liked me. I said, oh, Tim, how could you say that? You knew all about the book. I don't know anything. About it. I hadn't. I think I'd read the book, but I said, you're so he was Tim is one of the people I just have loved the most in my life. Just a wonderful human being. And Elizabeth Schwarzkopf, as we were leaving the room, we were in her hotel room. Uh, when we interviewed her, and I had done the uh, the audio part of it, I'm never really a great IT guy, but I've always figured out how to do that, thank God, because we wouldn't have had it. And she said, you ask very good questions. That's like getting the biggest Christmas gift that you ever wanted in your whole life. For Elizabeth Schwarzkopf to say that to me. Yes. was, And I mean, I grew up on her recordings. I adore her still. Yes. And I, I was like, and, and, and I still remember, I can hear her voice and Tim yeah. smiled and it was, you know, Tim and I were already very good friends then, but it was a wonderful experience. It really yeah. was. So, and I'm sure you've had many of those. How did it transpire? I will turn this on you now. Now I'm going to interview you. <laughs> How did it transpire that you did a, 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 an interview with Tim? What an interesting, what an interesting pairing, actually, you and Tim. I think that's... I'll, 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 I'll give you the short version. Uh, by the way, I worked my first job in the record business was at Cray's Records on Bromfield Street. I was oh, there wow. one week. They fired the manager. I was 19. And I said, I can't be the manager. I don't know how to be a manager. And the guy said, why? He didn't know either. Let's try it out. <laughs> <laughs> it was sort of like, I'll think about it. Yes. yes. And I went, he said, you're the manager. I was like 19 years old. I was clueless. Wow. It was so much fun. I enjoyed it so much. Sometimes you need people to believe in you. More. Well, I learned a lot in the the, yeah. in the the like two weeks that I worked for Crazy Disc Shop. I learned a lot because it, it was pretty slow in the Prudential Center. There weren't very many people, people that went in there looking for records. And so mm -hmm. I just went from bin to bin reading all the backs <laughs> of the <laughs> records, reading all the notes. So uh, actually, the uh, how Elizabeth Schwarzkopf came about was Tim and I were good friends because I worked in the music business involved with a company that was importing um, operatic performances, uh, Prizer Records and Discophilia. And mm -hmm. uh, we brought in EMI from Europe that Angel didn't bring in. So mm -hmm. I, I started getting to a lot of people early, but Tim was at WKCR doing some radio programs and I was a guest host there many times actually uh, and did interviews. And this fellow called me up. I'm sorry, I can't remember his name, but I remember him, he was very nice. He was a close friend of, of Eleanor Stieber, and she had heard one of the programs, and she said, I'd like to do, I'm celebrating something, I'd like to do a radio broadcast with the, that fellow on, on the radio station, which was me. So I was invited up to Eleanor Stieber's house in uh, apartment in the Ansonia, in the Ansonia yeah. where she had a big American flag on the wall, I still remember, and a grand piano. And she was a hoot. And I will say, I have the interviews about 45, 50 minutes. I have three hours. Uh, she was absolutely wonderful. She, I it was a wonderful. And Martha was the other one who sort of was the Martha Moore Smith. Yeah. Martha. <laughs> yeah. It was wonderful. And Eleanor is like, you know, she was good for me because she was very direct. She did all the work, really. And I adored her. I had grown up on her butterfly and other recordings, uh, you know, as a kid. Uh, she was very nice to me, very, and she called me and thanked me afterwards, which is, they all, actually, almost all of the singers did that. Yes, that's lovely. Interesting. So that was my first in 1980, uh, my first interview. But then I did, uh, you know, I interviewed... Uh, Michael, I saw. Uh, uh, Baron Michael, who was delightful. I have lots of stories. We could leave this for another program, because I can tell you some funny stories. I'm 77 now. I'm not worried so much about what I say anymore. And I, <laughs> and, I and all of the singers I interviewed, I loved. Lucia Pop is emotionally the most, uh, it was, I can't even, I almost can't talk about it because it's amazing. There are like a hundred and there was something like a 1,800 views on YouTube for the interview I did with her. It was the only interview ever done in English that she ever did in English. She was wow. singing Pamina at the Mat and Ben Feichel was singing um, Yohanahan. Oh. Yeah, Yo no, you're right. She sang both. He sang Yohanahan and um both from at the Met the same year and they both stayed in the same hotel so I got to know both of them very well because I was selling some of their recordings so we became friendly and with both of them they're both delightful mm -hmm. wonderful beings. 
uh, and Lucia unfortunately died very young with brain cancer. She was a great singer. And then Renata Scotto, who I had, uh, that's Ren of the time too, but I was a fanboy of Renata Scotto. I went to almost every performance she ever did at the Met. I used yeah. to go to the Met three to five times a week. So well, I, asked I, I, have, I have, have rehearsal say. stories about her. Okay, we'll save that for her birthday. <laughs> <We're just not laughs> she's wonderful and, and she's still going strong. She's oh, doing, yeah. You know, oh, yeah. She's wonderful. She's always very kind to me. I can't say enough. Uh, and Bob Lombardo, her manager, who got um, yes. me into a lot of the performances. But I, yeah. I went to hundreds of her performances. I heard her in Cincinnati. Right. And so those are, and Leech Albanese, who was very funny. She was incredibly warm and very, very charming. And I went to her house. Yes, on, I was on, there on, too. Yes. Uh, yeah, it was more marble than the baths of Calacara yes. in her apartment <laughs> and lots of velvet. She was fabulous. It was exactly yeah. what I expected. I loved it. A huge painting of her as Violetta, remember? Yes, yes, yes. And, and pictures of the Pope. And it was wonderful. <laughs> it was wonderful. It was exactly what I thought it would be. And she was wonderful. And she made Italian. Renato Scotto and Nietzsche Albanese made Italian coffee in the way that very few people could make it. It was delicious. Yeah. And uh, she brought out little, you know, little goodies and coffee. And we, we, she was wonderful. She talked, she was just, every one of them was so different. So yeah. different. Yeah. So did I leave anybody out? I don't think so. But we were anyway, talking about Donna. We had, we have a yes. Oh, I, so I would, a little segue into where something. So Donna sang the aria from Ariadne, Ariadne of Narcissus. And, um, I immediately just, I was in love with the voice uh, and we became friends and we have maintained our friendships through the year, our friendship through the years. Mm -hmm. um, wonderful human being. She speaks very highly of you. Oh, that's sweet. Uh, well, I speak very highly of her too. I think she's a wonderful, wonderful singer and a, and a, a lovely, lovely person. Um, I haven't seen her in years, actually. She, she came here to Rochester years ago when the Rochester Opera, Opera, Opera Theater of Rochester it was, Opera Theater of mm -hmm. Rochester. And I conducted a Cosi Fan Tutte for them. And the cast was uh, Christine Chazinski, who's mm -hmm. unfortunately dead now, um, who was a brilliant soprano. Donna, Donna was the, was the, 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 the um, uh, Dora Bella. The Despina was Harold Blackwell. Um, I won't even go to, to the down to the men, but it was it was that kind of cast. It was mm -hmm. just a, a wonderful, wonderful cast. And I haven't seen her since. Actually, we I think we chatted on the phone once about something or another. I don't even remember what it was. Um, and occasionally, I'll say something on Facebook or something. I'll see her on Facebook, and I'll. Mm -hmm write to her but is it on facebook or is it on some other social no it's media? facebook it, it's facebook yeah. I, I see it because we're but we're all friends on facebook and I yeah see that correspondence so she's still teaching she's still teaching she's teaching good. Yeah. wonderful yeah wonderful at the conservatory she's at the conservatory um i think a few hours a week and then she also has private students as well so she's doing both good, good. We're all still singing in some way. They pay me not to sing. Every once in a while, somebody say, do, do you sing? I say, no, they actually pay me not to sing it. I'm serious. <laughs> you don't want to hear it. You really don't want to hear it. I want to ask you about something that you've done in your life that I know you love, and I think, I believe you'd like to tell us about, and that is Si Parla Si Canta. Si Parla Si Canta. Yes, I'd love to talk to you about Si Parla Si Canta. Uh, I've done an awful lot of things in my life that I'm proud of, but I think C. Parla Sicanta is the thing that I'm proudest of. Uh, in, in, in the end, I think it's probably the best thing that I've ever done. Um, C. Parla Sicanta is uh, an Italian language program for singers. And uh, you might say, well, there are lots of there are lots of programs for singers. You know, this is a summer program, you know, that, that students can go to when the, their schools are not in session. <clears throat> and it's true, there are quite a lot of programs in Italy for the during the summers. But 
And I've worked for some of those programs. And I was always very frustrated working for those programs because in my opinion, they try and do too much in the course of a summer. Um, one of the programs that I worked with during the summer, they did full productions of operas. At least that's what they said. They did full productions of, of operas, you know, costumes and lights and sets and blah, 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 and, and all of that. And um, the students uh, were going to their lessons, going to their voice lessons and going to their coachings and they were going to their, uh, their staging rehearsals, which sometimes lasted until 11 o'clock at night. And in the morning, they're all supposed to have their Italian class, which started at nine o'clock and went until 1230, I think it was, nine until 12, 1230. But of course, they had been in into rehearsals in rehearsals until eleven o'clock the night before. So when the alarm went off, by the time they got to the second week of the program, they had stopped going to Italian class. And what I wanted to have, what I wanted to start, was an Italian language program that really was an Italian language program. That the the most important thing about the program is the learning of Italian. So then, so I came upon si parla, si canta. First you parla, then you canta. And it doesn't take very long to discover that the better you parla, the better you canta. <laughs> 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 and it was a tremendous success from, the, from its beginning, actually. I started it in 2007. And we just continued right on uh, up, and, up through 2019. And then all of a sudden, COVID came. And that sort of put us in on hold for, you know, three years, as it turns out. We decided not to do anything last summer either. But now we're back. We're back again this summer. And uh, I'm really proud of the program. I think it's, I think it's really fine. We do a lot of singing, of course. The, and the, the, my faculty is just unbelievable. It's unbeatable. Uh, you know, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful Italian singers, mostly, mostly Italians. Uh, but I do have Chris Merritt, who's, who's an American, but he's on my faculty. And uh, Chris and uh, Kim Josephson, who's, uh, who's, in, uh, who's at the University of Miami. Those are my only two Americans who are on my faculty. Everybody else is Italian. Uh, yes, we, it's, it's a very good program. And the place where the program is, is Arona, which is right on the shores of Lago Maggiore, uh, just halfway between Milan and Switzerland. It's not hard to look at. It's not hard to look at. It's really wonderful. So we should yeah. both go to Italy very soon. Yeah, lovely idea. Uh, lovely idea. One never knows. Everything is strange. And, and with COVID, it changed so many things. And one of the things I think that has come out of this, it may or may not be for everybody, I was very resistant to Zoom. If I didn't listen to Adam, who you met before, he's yeah. one of our technicians here, he said, you have to open yourself up to Zoom because you're yeah. limiting yourself too much. And this is so, it really works. But I had a, I don't even know why I was so resistant, but it's worked well. And we were able to do this. Well, it requires a certain amount of, of uh, of, of, of work on your part to to get used to the 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 pros and 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 the cons of Zoom. There are pros and there are cons. Uh, the delay in the in the sound is it is a problem. In other words, I, I can't play an aria here and have them sing it there and be able no. to function. Yeah. It oh. So uh, so what has to happen or what should happen is that they get a pianist. They have a pianist there that, that plays for them. And then I can then I can coach. I can coach them both, actually. I can coach both the singer and the pianist. So that works. You just have to get used to it and know that there's a slight delay in the sound. And the sound isn't totally true, but that doesn't have so much to do with Zoom, but rather the equipment on which you're listening to it. That's true with when you listen to YouTube. For me, I have, uh, although I'm not a musician, uh, my pitch is really, really, I mean, I think from many years of listening to recordings growing up, I listened to, at age five, I was turning the uh, 
the 78 player for my grandfather. And that's, I started listening to opera at five years old. So my ear is really tuned to, and I love singers sometimes who sing off pitch now and then because they're mostly on pitch and every once in a while they don't get a note here and there, who cares? Yeah. You know, life goes on. They're great still. Yeah, they're right, great right. Performance. But there is something about some of the YouTube when you transfer it, I think, and listen to it, it's very metallic sounding in a way that a really good record isn't. You know, you know, so it's subjective, and that's always, as we know, both being on Facebook. That's right. That's a, that's Lots that's a, that's, a reason, <laughs> that's the reason that the Collis and the Tabaldi rivalry, which never really existed, you know, mm -hmm. but, that's, but but you have to be careful with that because that's going to be our next vodcast. I have a list of things that we could oh, do. Okay. So yeah. I know. Can I talk about your father? For me? Sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> you mentioned that your father used to bring Maria Callas recordings home and yeah. you fell in love with Tibaldi. And, you know, they both said in interviews, which we have a documented them speaking, saying it was very good for their careers that there was a rivalry. I love the way they both said rivalry, especially Tibaldi. She, I love yes. the way she praised the word or said the word. It was charming. Yes. And I adored her. Your father brought home the Carlos, Maria Callas recordings, and you love Tibaldi. So in our next podcast, we could discuss, in a civil sort of way, with no boxing gloves. <laughs> the whys and wherefores. Is, <laughs> is there any reason to even have a rivalry? I mean, seriously. No. You know, and I'm only saying no. Maria Callas and Renata Tibaldi because I'm putting them in alphabetical order because I want yeah. you to know. Yeah. Even though I'm, so I think we should talk about these are things I thought about that we could do together. But uh, but again, you used the word subjective a second ago, and that's just exactly what it is you know, about, about Collis. I mean, I can I mean, and now, of course, I'm a real Collis acolyte. I, you know, I, I adore her. I have every note that she ever put on recording, you know, on my CD shelf downstairs. Mm -hmm. And I think I have probably everything that Tabaldi recorded too, although it gets a little sad at the end. Um, she tended to drift a little south occasionally, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but anyway. Details, no, no details. <laughs> but I mean, but the, the sound of that voice and I, I, I never heard Collis in person, never heard her in person, but I heard, uh, Tabaldi several times in several times in person, and I remember being, you know, way up in the balcony, uh, in whatever theater it was, hearing Tabaldi sing, and it sounded like she was just she sounded like she was right here in front of me, and with that sound that just enveloped you like a a, a warm blanket, it was unbelievable the sound of that voice. It's easy to say why Tabaldi, why Toscanini said what he said about her. It was the voice of an angel. And, and and not just one of those, you know, little, you know, light blue angels, you know, not one of those little, <laughs> little skimpy things. I mean, this was an, this was an angel with, you know, you know, a lot of power. <laughs> so to our listeners, seriously, and I'm not, you know, I don't always tell the truth exactly. They call it dissembling. But anyway, Benton and I both love Tabaldi and Palace, so it will not be like, it'll. it's more like take a look at it and say, why did this happen? Maybe, you know, whatever. We'll do some discussion about it. And right. I think Eleanor Stieber, I think we should tell some Stieber stories. We both have them. And I, and, you know, a lot of people love her. She, on, when I post things about her on um, Facebook, a lot of people come out of the woodwork that I don't hear from often who love her. She was a very loved singer. Yes. And then we have to talk about, not today, we have to talk about Uta Graf. And I will tell you next time why I mentioned Uta Graf. And Benton knows Uta Graf. She, he met her. Yeah. And I have a special her, place her. in my heart for her. Yeah. And then the last thing will be all of the, all of the questions that have been unanswered on, on any kind of social media or books about, I'll give you only one example. I'm not telling you anymore. Just for today. And I won't give them to you on email either. <laughs> I'm going to give them to you fresh on the on. Who was the priestess in Tibaldi, Renata Tibaldi's first Aida? I'll give you a hint. It's not on any recording. There's no name listed. Where was her first Aida? It, 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 the recording itself, a ready conduct. 
But where did she sing it? Where did she sing it? No, I mean it's on it's on London Records. Oh, oh, I see. It's not it's yeah. not alive. No, no, she recorded Aida twice, once with Carion, and that was the second recording with Berganzi, oh. Berganzi and Simeonato. The first recording is was recorded earlier on in her career in the early 50s, and it has a rede conduct. And no one has ever figured out who the pre high priestess is on that recording. So that's your homework for next time. Okay. Good. And I won't tell you the rest of the questions. And I hope some people are listening so we can get some emails on, on answers to some of these things. I've been collecting all of these un unanswered questions on Aqua. And it would be fun to start doing a little of this so we could get together and maybe figure out some of them. Some people guess that it's Tivaldi that sang it, but I don't think so. No, this, this was Tivaldi's this was Tivaldi's Aida, right? Tivaldi's Aida, it was her first recording because she recorded it twice. Yes, so now we're talking about who was the priestess. Who was the high priestess in Aida. Yeah. And, she, and some people guess that Tibaldi actually- Oh, she sang it herself. Self. I don't think so. I listened to it this morning because <laughs> I was gonna, I knew I was gonna ask you the question and it doesn't sound at all like her. So, but nobody knows. And if you look at all the recordings that have been, it's been reissued a number of times. There's uh -huh. never a name for the Aida. Isn't that a curiosity? Yes. And I have four or five of them like that. So I'll ask, and, and I don't even know what the answers are to most of these. But no. they're all very, they're things like, oh, I never thought about that. I never thought the fact that it is, there's no name there. I'm just thinking of all the possibilities for the high priestess in, in Tabaldi. It could be, it could be Renata Scotto. Uh, she would have been, I, I, you know who I thought of? Uh, Teresa Stritch Randall. Oh. Who had recorded it with, um, isn't she on the Toscanini recording with her Vanelli? I think she is. I don't know. Yeah. And Richard. Wow. Tucker. That's, yeah. wow. I th see, I thought it, I, it doesn't sound like her either. So anyway, we that's your homework for next time. Okay. And then I'm going to ask you now another question. What advice would you give to singers in the early stages of their respective careers? Uh -huh. um, listen, I think a lot of, I think a, a lot of singers think that it's their, that the most important thing they can do is to show people with whom they work, people with whom they interact, how much they already know about singing and what people really want to know, like stage directors and conductors and that sort of thing. They don't want to know how much you know already. They want to know how much you can take in and how fast you can take it in. I think that's really important. I think people don't listen enough. Would I add anything to that? Let me think. What about preparation in knowing scores or knowing music, or maybe the approach of? Well, I think that that yes, of course, um, and making sure that making sure that your languages are all in good working order, and and making sure that you know the standard the standard repertoire that people are going to expect you to know something about and be able to learn it's i think it's a good idea if young singers take a uh, take a good look at at their own voices and the repertoire that they might be expected to sing and might they might want to get a head start on learning some of those roles for instance i'm thinking about you, you don't want to be a soprano and get a call one day saying, I know that Susanna in Nozze di Figaro is a perfect role for you. We need somebody to come in and fill, you know, and fill in for this person who's just called in sick in, in a month's time. You don't want to learn Susanna in a month. I'm not even sure you can. <laughs> There's too much of it, you know? So, Knowing that sort of thing is is really good, but as I said before, you can't know all the standard repertoire. You can 
try and know the pieces that you think might show up pretty fast, but um, but it's hard. It's kind of hard to second guess there. Making sure that you're making sure that your languages are in really good working order. Of course, that's a given. Making sure that you're as as good a musician as you can possibly be. Um, there's an awful lot to singing. There's an awful lot you have to know, an awful lot that you have to do. Um, and the more you know, the better off you're going to be. A, a friend of, of mine, and, and my, uh, we went to the opera in Toronto to hear Speranza Scapucci conduct. Oh, she was amazing. And she conducted the Bar Barbara Seville. And I was just blown away. And she's Eb, she is delightful. I can't say enough about her. She's so nice. Uh, but the conductor was fabulous. And I can say that as a conductor, I hope that's okay. Oh, yes, uh, absolutely. <laughs> she was really, she really, she found. No, I've heard the conductor. She's the, she's the real oh, saint. She, and she, she found things in the, that I hadn't heard before. I was like, that's amazing. And she, and the, or, just the orchestra was very good. And I will say out of my own feelings, uh, as uh, uh, Santiago Villarini sang a fabulous, Fabulous, uh, Alma Viva. Anyway, she came to the Met. She's the first woman. She's the first Italian woman to conduct at La Scala. That was yes. There's never been a woman yes. condu that's conducted at La Scala that was Italian yeah. born. She's from Rome. Yeah. And then she came to New York, and it was the same thing. She's the first Italian born woman Always to conduct at the Met, and she conducted. I, I have to say, and I'll stop after this. I thought I'd levitate that night. Uh, this this group was unbelievable. We went to it wasn't the the people who they had put on the HD, uh, the singers. Uh, it was um, Benjamin Bernheim who was just incredible, and uh, Rosa Fiola who was also incredible. She was one yeah. of the best jilters I've ever heard in my life, and um, Quinn Kelsey who was wonderful, very moving. Yes. So that was, but I I have to say, and I love them all. I love all three of them were wonderful. But Speranza, she worked her magic. And I have to say, when she conducted, for me, this is just out of my own head, one of the best conducted Rigolettos I've ever heard in my life. She found new things that I had never heard before. She's a really, she's a great conductor. Yeah, I, I agree. It's good. It's good. So have I worn you out? Are you tired? Oh, you no, not at all. <laughs> I'm getting a little thirsty, but anyway. Um, <laughs> So when should we meet again? Should I give you a couple of year, a couple of uh, weeks rest, and we'll come yeah, back? Whenever, yeah. I mean, yeah, whenever is fine with me. A couple of weeks would be good. Yeah. Kind That's of re regroup and think of things you want to talk about. Yes, wonderful. This is fun to reminisce. I want to thank you, Benton, for a number of things. Many, many, many things, including those. Those those dinners you cooked when you were a student invited me over to listen to music. <laughs> I remember listening to Inga Bork. I don't know why that sticks in my mind. Oh, I, and I've never heard of her. Electra? Did you listen to Electra? You got it. <laughs> and I was I was immediately like, wow, because I had you know I was just starting myself with collecting and so forth. And you're a good cook. I don't know if you're a better cook than John Moriarty, who also cooked as well. I was invited there for dinner a few times. You're both very good. Very good. And you both are very, very much vivid in my, that period of time. Uh, I was surrounded by a lot of very nice people. It was a very magical time in a lot of ways. Yes. I stop and talk to Beethoven once in a while in, in the corridor. Oh, give him my best, please. I will. I will. You know who I mean. Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, always we always met at Beethoven at Ludwig, right? Yes, and sure. Everybody met at Ludwig. Yeah. So you will come back to us and we will continue our conversation. I would like nothing better. Benton Hess, thank you for joining us today on Speaking Opera, and we will see you next time. Thank you, Howard. Ciao. Ciao. Speaking Opera is a nonprofit endeavor that focuses on documenting the career activities of currently active singers, composers, musicians, and authors in the field of operatic performance and scholarship, and specialists in the field of audio recording, as well as those who have retired 
fully or partially from performing and or teaching. Under Section 107 of the Copyright Act of 1976, allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. Nonprofit, educational, or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use.